I'm Michael Bradshaw, the current president of the Bermuda Friendly Societies Association. And this is a collaboration of the currently active Friendly Societies in Bermuda, um, also colloquially known as the Black Lodges. But um, we don't just have black membership. And I'm also a researcher. I'm retired, and I'm a researcher with, I guess, my greatest passion is the understanding of social history, how Bermuda has evolved, particularly as regard the black population, from the days immediately before and after emancipation until today. Um, most history has focused on the movers and shakers, the significant parties. You hear about a battle, you hear about the general, you don't hear about the soldiers, the uh, women at home who were all crucial, who all suffered impacts from this war. We talk about Bermuda and we talk about the dockyard, we talk about the changes. We don't understand what happened to the populations and because certain populations were ignored, you don't hear of them in history. And that's why I'm interested in the social history. Friendly society is an interesting concept. Uh, in Bermuda, what it specifically has meant is an organization of people who've come together, work together with the principles of self-help and mutual help. And I say particularly uh, in Bermuda, because although that idea has found some thought, its origins in the UK and Europe, we also know that this principle of community ownership, community being one, is very much something from a number of regions in uh, West Africa, also some of the Southern African groups. And again, if we know our history, we know that the enslaved people came from those regions, the enslaved people particularly. in the, So it's also a thought that, that there may have been a general theme of self-help uh, that was already resident in the population. So it's something that's found throughout the Caribbean, and we share the friendly societies with that. We share the friendly societies with uh, the UK. But one of the things that is different about Bermuda is the um, independence of the friendly societies. Our friendly societies are a little different in that aspect from the um, uh, um, West Indian models. Let me just give a little further elaboration on, on what we mean when we talk about the friendly societies in Bermuda as well, because that, that's something that's different. Bermuda also, very early on, developed what we call local friendly societies. And that came about in part because in our history, we've always had a, not a large number, but a fair, enough to be significant number of persons who were not enslaved. They were here as free blacks. There were people <clears throat> who might have been formerly enslaved, but were freed by their masters yet during the time of slavery. So these free blacks were able to form a population during the time of slavery. They recognized the need to be able to do some things for themselves and for the general community. And they formed groups that were interested in self-education. In the time when people did not have libraries, books were valuable. People might only have a few books. They would share books. So we've had these friendly societies that actually have been noted before the emancipation time, before 1834. In 1834, and shortly thereafter, um, we got a new growth of friendly societies in Bermuda and in the West Indies, which were set up to look after the needs of the newly freed, the formerly enslaved. And these we call local friendly societies. And they persisted for quite a while. But soon after the local friendly societies, you got what we call the international friendly societies. And these were friendly societies that um, originated in the larger metropolis. So you might get um, the good, um, the odd fellows, for example. And most people know of the odd fellows. People would know of things like the Good Samaritans. These are all foreign, internationally linked friendly societies. So we have two parallel tracks in a way. The local origin friendly societies, which tended to be very locally focused, very um, um, could be small because they drew upon the Bermuda population, regionalized. So you had them in um, town and Bailey's Bay, et cetera. You also got the international friendly societies, which came as people from the local friendly societies wanted to be linked to something bigger, 
Bermudians were also great travelers because they were mariners, they were traders, etc. So they brought back ideas of bigger friendly societies that, could be, that they could link to and which could allow them to do even bigger things than what was carrying on in Bermuda. And most people, when they think of friendly societies now, think of the international friendly societies. The, um, as I said, the Good Samaritans, the Odd Fellows, the Shepherds, the Foresters, etc. Um, as I said, the um, local friendly societies did exist for quite a while, but were eventually generally superseded by the international friendly societies. Another little caveat there, um, the PLP building actually is housed in a local friendly society building, Working Men's Aid Helping Society and Ladies of Industry. They were the first friendly society in Bermuda to give mortgages at a time when something totally unheard of. So the local friendly societies could be significant. But on the other hand, because of the greater pool, because of the greater numbers, because of the greater financial uh, um, status, the international friendly societies, so again, the Good Samaritans, the um, Odd Fellows, and all those sorts of things, they provided financial assistance for entrepreneurs. They were the ones that were basically um, set up our um, primary school system in, in, in particular in Bermuda. They were the ones that built the large halls and provided those sorts of resources. So we now really refer, when we talk about lodges, unless you're a specialist or a lodge member in, in the area, most people uh, refer to the friendly societies as the international friendly societies, but they shouldn't be thought of as having been the only ones. There were probably about um, eight different orders, and by an order we mean a group of friendly, uh, friendly societies which would have certain commonalities of behavior, of what were their founding principles, and that sort of thing. And as I said, um, there were probably about eight, but these friendly society orders themselves would have individual lodges. So I reckon that they probably were with the international and the local ones approaching between 70 and 100 in Bermuda, which again is notable because it's a fairly small population, but it speaks about the different attitude of the Bermuda population and how our friendly societies were different. Um, of the international order, you probably had may be about half that number. So um, of those, we have seven that still exist and five that are probably active. So we've gone down. And I would have said that if you were 1950, you probably would have still had a good 30, 40. Um, I, I know that because um, the Friendly Society Council had, uh, we have records for a meeting in 1950. Not everyone belonged to them, but they had uh, 23 people, um, 23 um, organizations attending the council. So I reckon they were probably at least around about 30. So we're down to about five now and looking for persons who are interested in community, who are energetic. You must believe in God. Um, it doesn't even, uh, you must believe in God and you must believe that there is one God. And you must recognize the importance of your fellow man and fellow man, fellow woman. You must recognize the value of community. Those are the cardinal principles of being a member of the friendly societies. Getting from the West, you have the Loyal Irresistible Lodge, an independent order of Odd Fellows, Manchester Unity. This is a lodge that houses both men and women in the same lodge, but the lodge is actually um, controlled by the men. So that's a nice way of putting it. And that lodge is up to Dean's Bakery. Most people in Somerset know it as a lodge with the um, clock tower. Coming along opposite uh, St. Um, St. James's Church, you have the Victorian Albert Lodge, Grand United Order of Odd Fellows. Notice that they are... Um, also an Odd Fellows order, but slightly different to the independent order of Odd Fellows. And the Victorian Albert Lodge, um, I will quickly say, was one of the lodges that was known as the Cup Match Lodges, and that will be important a little bit later on. Victorian Albert Lodge is a men's lodge, but it also had a parallel lodge, what is called a sister's lodge within it, which is the Household of Ruth Lodge. Um, I believe that was Household of Ruth number 273. Um, 
Yes, Somerset. We have to go all the way to Warwick until we find any active lodge again. And um, the next active lodge is actually the Princess Royal Union Lodge, Independent Order of Good Samaritans and Daughters of Samaria, number 135. As I said, that's my home lodge. That's why I should have jumped up and snatched to snapped to attention. But that's my home lodge. Um, the first two uh, lodges, or the first set of lodges we spoke about were Oddfellows Lodges. This is Good Samaritans. And in the name, it has Good Samaritans and Daughters of Samaria. And the Samaritan Lodges are unique in that they are the only order which are run jointly by a man and a woman. Um, whereas other lodges may have a female lodge within the um, lodge, or females may be a part of the lodge, the lodges are traditionally run by males. That was the nature of the social order of that time that men took precedence. Remember, women didn't vote. They had difficulties with earning property. The Samaritans were an intentional creation. And part of that was they sought equity for females. And so they have, in our constitution, it's required that a man and a woman jointly run the lodge. Also something that would be significant about Samaritans is that um, there is no recognition of race in the Samaritans lodge. So you do not have, as you had with some of the other orders, you were able to have black lodges and white lodges. Samaritans did not allow that. They had only all persons being able to be in the same lodge. Um, so that's, and the Samaritans come out of the American system, uh, the post-abolition system in America. So it was very, a very a time of great, and, and after the French Revolution, so it was an idea of great progress in equality and those sorts of things. Um, coming into town, uh, and the next ones we'll come to is Alexandrina Lodge on Court Street. Everyone knows Alexandrina Lodge next to the bank, um, bank of, uh, what's it, HSBC on Church Street, corner of Church and Court. And it is another very significant lodge. Alexandrina Lodge belongs to the Grand United Order of Oddfellows. So again, I remind you, we talked of the Victorian Albert. The um, Alexandrina Lodge, anything that was happening in Bermuda from the, from the beginning of the 1900s happened via Alexandrina. Anything you want, politics, unions, churches, integration of football, the movers and shakers came out of Alexandrina as the town, as Hamilton was the center of everything. Alexandrina is again male lodge. It has within it a female lodge household of Ruth, um, number 61. So in that sense, it runs the parallel to what we talked about for Victorian Albert. Also in town, you have opposite People's Pharmacy. Everyone knows that lodge because of where it's located, opposite People's Pharmacy. And if you're a little bit older, you'll know it as the site of the old opera house. So that allows some reference for, for, for others. And that has been a very active feature of Hamilton. Um, two lodges in there. The Loyal Flower of the Day Lodge, which despite its name, is actually a male lodge. Flower was referred to as the most beautiful, most uh, uh, progressive element. So we talk of the flower of the army. Flower was not used as it is now thought of as being dainty and frail. So these men were the flower of their day, the flower of the day lodge. And that's independent order of odd fellows, Manchester Unity. The sister lodge in there is the loyal Mayflower Lodge. Again, independent of odd fellows, Manchester Unity. So you have two lodges in there, much as um, you had the two lodges in the uh, um, Alexandrina Lodge, but a slight difference in the order. Then we may as well go all the way to St. George's, where we come across at the, I don't know St. George's as well as other things, on the main road to St. George's, on the corner as you turn up Rose Hill. Everybody in St. George's knows it as Summer's Playhouse, Summer's Lodge. That's the Summer's, uh, Summer's Pride of India Lodge. Independent, sorry, Grand United Order of Odd Fellows. And it also had a female lodge in it, which was, uh, I believe, called the Ponciana Lodge. But that would have been part of the Household of Ruth series. 
The Summer's Pride of India Lodge was the first international lodge to come to Bermuda. Interestingly enough, if you think about it, the um, emancipation took place in 1834. I said we had some local friendly societies, which had even existed before 1834. And you had Bermudians being fairly progressive, fairly broad-minded for their day. Um, thinking, well, what can we do? What can we do to become more involved, to get more uh, participative in terms of uh, voting and those sorts of things which were denied to the majority of the population, um, to get into business, to get into uh, controlling our education. And you had a set of men who sat around a pride of India tree. And Bermuda was known as the Summer's Isle. And these guys included fellows who were working on the ships. And eventually, they sort of got the idea, you know, one of the guys has told us about this thing they have going on in Philadelphia. They have this big thing guys doing just like we're doing, but on a grander scale. And so they sent a group, a delegation up, and they actually petitioned. And Bermuda was the first lodge to be formed outside of the USA of Oddfellows. So the Oddfellows had gone to the USA, and the story of the Odd Fellows is another story why there are two groups. It's a black-white issue. <laughs> but the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows was the version of Odd Fellowship that existed in the USA, and we were the first lodge to be formed outside of the USA. And, uh, and that became the Summer's Pride of India Lodge, Grand United Order of Odd Fellows. I will talk to you a little bit about how the friendly societies progressed to this cricket thing and then eventually this cop match thing because I think that that's a story that has its own fascination. So the friendly societies um, in 1834 made a promise to the populace of Bermuda, again one of the unique, unique things about Bermuda, and basically said to the guys who were about to be no longer enslaved, so this took place before August 1st, and said to people, and, and another thing to be noted is that Bermuda is one of the only two places in the world that took its emancipation in 1834. Other countries had to go through a period of apprenticeship, it was called, um, in which people were to be adjusted and to be acculturated to the idea of being free and being able to do these things that were expected of citizens. The um, British government basically said, OK, we're going to abolish slavery. And the planters, the people who controlled the colonists, said, hang on a minute. You do that, it's going to be difficult for us. These guys are not going to want to work. These guys are not going to want to work for me. These guys are going to want wages. They're going to want to ask for outrageous things. They're going to be lazy. They don't work unless they've got a whip on them, et cetera, et cetera. And so the British government said, to the enslavers, so how do you want us to do this? And the enslavers said, yeah, let's do it gradually. Let's give them a time when we can teach them how to be, because we already think they're savages, we can teach them how to be civilized and normal, how to work for a steady wage, how to turn up whether you're sick or you're tired, how to come even if your wife, etc., is at home. So, you know, you need to be adjusted to all of this and how you have to behave to the guy who is your master. And so, sorry, not your turn, master. Who's your boss? And literally, they ask the masters, slave masters, this. And the slave master said, okay, um, we reckon it will take X number of years and gradually it was whittled down to six years. So people had to serve this apprenticeship of up to six years in which they could not leave the plantation. They would still have to work a certain number of days per week. Um, the difference was that they were given assigned days when they could work for themselves, to feed themselves. They were also allowed to generally sell their own produce. Most places, slaves could not sell their own produce. That's again a place, an area in which Bermuda was different from many places. Um, but um, So they had a few freedoms, 
but these were freedoms which were simply given as concessions by someone else. They were not opportunities which were negotiated by the enslaved. They were a little bit here and there that was given from the uh, um, um, slave masters. And so there was this great sort of fear that when emancipation came about, if you no longer could control them, and if they decided not to pay attention to the apprenticeship period, well, we're going to have you know, hell and high water on our hands. Um, and that's part of the reason that the British government, it's believed part of the reason why the British government sort of agreed to this, the, even the people who were uh, really pushing for abolition, agreed to this period of you know, gentle introduction of these principles, et cetera, et cetera, even though the, they were very much for immediate uh, emancipation. So the friendly societies in Bermuda were significant, remembering that they existed before emancipation and being able to say to people, emancipation's coming next week. Here's the deal. We want you. Emancipation, we want you on, and emancipation was on a Monday. We want you on the Sunday, go to church, sing your praises, come home, have a good old time in the neighborhood, enjoy yourself, feel at liberty to be with gay abandon. On Monday, here's the agreement, you go to work. If your former master decides he doesn't want you on the job, he wants you hungry and without a job. If he says, I earned the clothes on your back, take them off. If he says, you no longer have anywhere to live, get off the place. Don't take anything with you because remember, slaves earned nothing. They did not earn their children. They did not earn their lives. They did not earn anything. So literally, depending on the attitude of the master, that was what could confront you. And remember, Bermuda was not going through a seasoning period, which would have allowed the adjustment and the amelioration of both the enslaver and the enslaved. We were going to have a direct transition. So the Friendly Society said, if you need housing, we are people who have something, substance. We will give you housing. We will give you credit. We will give you food. We will give you jobs. But we need a stable society. Again, part of the difference of Bermuda, most of the other places had huge majorities of black people. Huge, 95% black, etc. Bermuda had a 50-50 sort of balance. If there was instability, unrest, the colony would simply tear itself apart and the blacks would have been the inevitable losers because they did not control the arms, they did not control the the, the, the physical powers, mil military powers, political powers, they controlled nothing. They had some amount of, uh, of economic power in terms of the free blacks. And that's where these free blacks and the friendly societies basically came and said, you play ball, maintain stability, and we will take care of your immediate needs to the extent that they are not met, cannot be met by you. That's important. That was the first celebration of emancipation. Every year after that, these local friendly societies held a commemoration of the emancipation. And Bermuda is the only country in the world to have held a commemoration every year since 1834. So they held this commemoration and started by the friendly societies. Eventually, we morph into the international friendly societies coming along. They are bigger. They have um, overseas connections. They have a bit more money, a bit more organization. And so they sort of supersede, in terms of leadership, the original local friendly societies, which were small and, as I said, which tended to be very much locality based. So, from about the time of the 1840s, these um, grander, international friendly societies, assuming the leadership organization of the celebrations and organizing the picnics, 
the festivities that were community events, and eventually adding this thing that had arrived in Bermuda in the 1840s called cricket. And so we have cricket being coming part of celebrations that have been going on since 1834. And um, cricket is an interesting game, I think, to become part of the celebrations because it's quintessential English. Um, they didn't take football, which would have been considered a ruffians game. But foot, uh, cricket was for the upper classes. It was for the gentle people, the gentle folk, the men and the women in their finery. It also spoke to an idea of elegance, an idea of class consciousness, an idea of success, an idea of something that took more time. And these were the ambitions of the friendly societies. The friendly societies sought to elevate people from the simple drudgery of work with no respite. So all the aspects of the friendly societies, even though they catered very much to working class people, were about uh, providing for senior care, providing for education, providing for orphans, trying to lift the individual and the society to a better level. So I think the idea of cricket as a game that they chose for part of their celebration. So though it took more time and would, took more equipment and more money than would a game of football. Football, you just need a ball. Cricket, you need so much more. But it spoke to part of their ambitions and I think how they saw themselves. So that's the introduction of cricket into the friendly society uh, emancipation celebrations. Notice it wasn't called cup match. Cup match uh, came about in 1902. Um, again, so we have the Friendly Society celebrations every year. They're doing their thing. They're, um, all the lodges are getting involved. You have, as I said, the leadership taken over from, taking over by the Grand United Order, the major lodges, um, Victoria and Albert, um, Summers Pride of India, um, Alexandrina. But because of the whole idea of mutual health, all of the lodges were involved. So the matches involved people from all the lodges, but they decided to make up two teams, team from the east, team from the west, because you had Grand United Orders in the east and the west. So it was just a way of having two teams, competition, friendly rivalry. Um, but when you have the range of friendly societies, the range of lodges, there is also an interesting range in what I would call social norms. Now, I'll put it this way. Some lodges believe, let's have a good old time after the meetings. Let's have a drink, maybe a convivial glass of wine. Some believe, Let's raise the spirits and have a couple of shots of whiskey. But one of the things that was seen um, was that during slavery, alcohol was a real problem. In the post-emancipation, alcoholism continued to be a problem. So some of the lodges became what were called temperate lodges or some of the orders. And the temperance orders ranged in strictness from something like the um, uh, Good Samaritans. Good Samaritans discourage the use of alcohol. Emphasis on the word discourage. So Good Samaritans, we abhor drunkenness. We abhor gambling. The Good Templars, a different order, are so sincere or strict about abstinence that a person who is a member cannot be yoked, married, associated with, whatever you would want to call it, of someone who is a partaker. They were against people who um, temperance would be intemperate in speech, which might mean shouting, which might mean use of certain inappropriate words. So um, you have an event which is taking place with a number of people who are all celebrating together, playing on the team together,
but ranging from those who can have a low wage on who's going to make more runs than the other one. And this might be looked at a little askance by some people and totally forbidden by others who would no longer even want to play on the team. So it became necessary, clearly became necessary, that not only was the cricket match becoming so successful in its own right, because the friendly societies did this for the community. Community people turned out to associate with friendly society members to enjoy this celebration. It's spreading through the community. And the friendly societies probably, I would estimate, I'm taking from American numbers, probably were associated with about at least 60% of the population. So you've got a large number of people coming to the game, some who are not members. Even within the people who are coming, there are ranges in the degree of, shall we say, gaiety, frivolity that would be allowed. And so it became necessary to separate the celebratory side, the gambling and the drinking and the, you know, female fashions and finery and all the rest of that sort of real extravagance from the more strict, sober elements that were practiced in the friendly society. One other thing about friendly society is that one of our, our, our principles is that even within an individual order, we will not act in any way that causes a division. So we may have a stance but if it's something that requires voting that will bring about a division, we will not take it. We will allow the diverse elements within the group to remain because we don't vote on it. And the diverse elements then have an opportunity to use the assets, because the assets belong to all, to promote their own particular view. So um, it became easier to say, you know what, this thing is really great. This thing is really exciting, but this thing is causing some of our people a little discomfort. It's doing something that's a little different from what some of us would want to do. It's also taking up a lot of time. It's also distracting from what are the principles of some of our orders and from the activities and the focus on recognizing emancipation in general. So we're going to go about and assist in the creation of these private clubs. So they're private clubs, but they're community clubs very important about St. George's and Thompson. They're not just private clubs for the sake of being private clubs, they're private community clubs. We're going to have these private clubs which are going to be allowed to take off this activity and they call it a cup match. And it started from 1902 and again the way it was set up was that they didn't want big donations so they took small donations, in fact they limited the amount of donations the people who started this came out of the friendly societies. Henry T. Cairn was one of the notable people, etc. A Grand United Order man. He was Victorian Albert Lords. So these were the people who started Cup Match and um, that separation. So it was, separ it was distinct from the friendly societies, but it was not intended to be separated from the friendly societies. Unfortunately, in later days, it became somewhat separated as people forgot the origins and the links between the two. The cup actually has a storied history which has been told several times. That um, the cup, as I said, was raised by contributions. They had people who actually wanted to donate the cup. And they said, no, this is meant to be a community event, which is something that's synonymous with the friendly society. It's always about community. And I should also add here that community didn't mean only the community of lodge men and lodge women. It meant community. So it's a distinction between um, what you will find with the friendly society uh, and some other, and I didn't introduce them, some other lodges. There are Freemasons lodges in Bermuda. Um, one of the peculiar things about um, the friendly societies is that a member is a member of the lodge and entitled to certain benefits. Anyone associated with a member is entitled as well. So you can be a family member, you can be a neighbor of a member, you can be a neighbor of a neighbor of a member. You still were entitled to use the Friendly Society assets as long as you use them through a Friendly Society member. And, and that's important about that real community 
uh, ethos, and you could see it from the origins post-emancipation. So the cop was meant to be the product of a community effort. So just like they now use the certain amount of money can only be put into American campaigns, friendly societies had that idea a long while ago. So you could only make these small donations to the cop. The cop was ordered from the UK, and the interesting thing is that a woman, again a notable thing, because men were thought to be the most important, but a woman was the first one to see the cop and pick up the cop, because it was, I think it was either the wife or the sister of, of Henry T. Cann. Um, cup, old traditional cup, silver cup, all that sort of thing. I like to do a little surmising, a little theorizing about the colors. Because most people, if you've done a little bit of history, will know that the St. George's colors, and I'm sporting St. George's colors, because I happen to like the blues, blue and blue. But I am not a St. George's supporter. So in the normal course of things, I would not wear this colors or this color combination after about mid-July. Definitely not after July 14, 15. Um, I'm the only one in my family who is not a St. George's supporter. Um, I'm a Somerset supporter. But the blues come from the racing colors of Oxford and Cambridge. Oxford and Cambridge, both racist. So here we have a colony, some 3,000 miles from England, freed and previously free uh, black persons, celebrating emancipation, and identifying with the Oxford and Cambridge boat races, upper class, there you go, St. George's. I'm going to just lean forward and show you something. This would be worn this way. This would be a friendly society, uh, what we call regalia. And this is what you would wear at your uh, membership meetings. Without this, you wouldn't be admitted. On this regalia, this membership regalia, is a rosette. Red, white, and blue. Red, white, and blue, hmm, red and blue. Is this the origin of the Somerset colors? Perhaps. But also red, white, and blue would be found in the American flag, would be found in the uh, French flag. If again we go back to the times, if we go back to the 1830s, if we go back to that period of history, and what was going on about that time, it was about freedom. It was about new ideas. It was about revolution. Red was all about blood, sweat, commitment. Blue was about achievement, bravery, um, a stout heart, what you necessary to do. So maybe those are the origins of the cup match colors for Somerset. Um, it would be a very, shall we say, uh, um, um, I think in keeping with the idea of doing things in a quiet way from the friendly societies, to have sneaked in the French colors, because the French believe in liberty, egality, and fraternity. And the friendly societies speak of brotherhood, they speak of equality, and they speak of um, freedom. So there are great similarities in the ideas of the friendly societies and the ideas of the French Revolution. But we have to remember the French Revolution was considered something to be feared by the British. So you could not talk too broadly of the French Revolution. But the friendly societies did what they did in a quiet sort of way, in a not overt sort of way. That's why friendly societies are sometimes mistaken in Bermuda for being secret societies. They were not secret societies. They were very open. How more open can you be than cop match? How more open than you, can you be than the friendly societies were constantly on parade for Thanksgiving services? Um, there's a Thanksgiving services held. Um, the Friendly Societies Association holds one every year in about um, 
October. Uh, the whole idea of becoming involved, becoming a membership, letting people know would not be something that would be consistent with a secret society. The Freemasons are a secret society. They don't parade. You don't know who they are. So it's a difference between a secret society, a true secret society, and a confidential private society, which had to be so because they did not control the powers of the day. So are these uh, the colors of the French flag? Are these the colors taken from the friendly societies? Whatever they are, they are my colors, red and blue, Somerset. In the general reading of the cup match history, not much is made about the significance of the colors. Maybe people don't know. Maybe people are a little ashamed because they think it's a black celebration of Bermuda and now so and so. So why should we talk about, you know, Oxford and Cambridge? But it's significant within the thinking of the times, what these guys and women were aspiring to do. They wanted to be accepted. They wanted to show that they could, under the terms of their world, be as successful as the best. And Oxford and Cambridge stood out. At the same time, I would not put it beyond them to have craftily brought in the ideas of the French Revolution or even the Haitian um, um, model because Bermudians, black Bermudians, the formerly enslaved Bermudians, were very adept at managing their way in a society that was pretty hostile to them. And the free blacks were particularly adept at it. So they knew how to, um, whether we want to go up later on and talk about managing the vote and how people collaborated in order to have money to be able to get a vote when you needed land and money to get a vote. We have generally worked very well together to assist the individual but not allow individuality to uh, uh, um, dispense with the community good. And I think that's been something that's been very important in Bermuda, something we've done very successfully in the past, something which I actually am a little bit upset at. Because in recent times, we have now thought that we are so able as an individual that we don't need each other. So, you know. so that's an interesting little thesis to play with. I would actually go back a little bit and first say how cup match was. Uh, I can't say the earliest days. Uh, despite the gray hair, I'm not that old. But um, when I was growing up. So we have to recognize that this was a celebration. That was a celebration organized by blacks, for blacks, and any who want to join in. Anything in Bermuda that has ever been called black has never been exclusionary because the range of those who have been called black or identify as black range all the way up from those who I think are white. My wife tells me I can't tell the difference. All the way down to people who, when I was young, were called black sembers. So anybody who identifies as black is black to me. So cup match was, a, I'm sorry, not cup match, but this Emancipation celebrations were always open to everyone. Cup match was always open to everyone. And it was, as I said, focused on the lodges, organized by the lodges. But anyone who had any association or wanted to claim any association with the lodge could and did attend. By the time I came along, cup match had, uh, and, and, and again, being a holiday, it being something which the, I don't think the, the white population would have appreciated or approved of. It was just something that the blacks did and there's others. In the um, early part of the 20th century, it started to get a little bit 
contentious because you know we had the Jim Crow, we had the sort of uh, um, separation of black and white. Maybe not as harsh as some people may think in other jurisdictions, but they say, he who feels the flesh knows the pain. And in those days, I can recall um, persons talking, people getting together, knowing that if you took off cup match, you probably wouldn't have a job when you went back. And folks talking about what day the boss was going to allow you, if the boss was going to allow you a day, if you were going to be, and it wasn't even said to be victimized, you were going to be penalized because people accepted at that time and thought it was normal that someone declared when you should work, how long you should work, <laughs> that was it. And yet, despite all of that, these people took a people's holiday at a certain time of the year, despite sometimes the risks and inconvenience and sobbing, etc., that took place afterwards, dressed up in their finery. And we always had the, the social aspects of cup match. You had to be well dressed in cup match and dressed up in their competitive colors and the sorts of um, high competition in the house. I can remember going cup match and as I said, my family supported the other team. I couldn't sit with my family. And it was, that's cool. Um, but it was no hatred, no animosity. It was a teasing, it was a lot of fun, a competitive sort of thing. Um, eventually, cup match was declared as a day. Labor, um, the labor unions had come in and was able to be negotiated as a day for a holiday. And it went from having only one day to eventually, whoa, people got two days holiday. They were taking two days anyhow. <laughs> you know, it just got, you didn't have to try to fake it to the boss or whatever else. People were going up to cup match, um, you know, having a grand time, seeing people from the other end of the island who you might not work with, seeing uh, um, people who were maybe working on the boats and those sorts of things who didn't always have time in Bermuda, made sure they were home for cup match. Um, so cup match was a big thing, not just in the black society, but was spreading out to the white society as well. We continue with cup match finally being recognized, I think, as a, as a significant institution when we got a change of government. And as we got that change of government, we got some recognition, people beginning to think back and say, hey, this cup match is not just something where you go out and you can play crown and anchor, Gambling being previously illegal in Bermuda, but you could do it at cup match because these blacks were going to do what they were going to do anyhow. Uh, you could drink in public at cup match. We, well, nowadays it's a little bit easier, but when, again, those days, drinking on the street was not allowed. So in the typical Bermudian inventiveness, they would put a beer in a brown paper bottle and drink from the brown paper bag. Cup match, people drank openly. So all the things that were part of the normal, very sober, structured, uh, um, um, almost puritanical society that was Bermuda, went into gay abandon for two days for cup match. But the significance of the emancipation commemoration was basically being lost. This came back into play when, as I said, with the change of government, a perhaps more active, but I would say a more focused community and cultural affairs department and effort at understanding the whole uh, um, um, range of contributors to Bermuda, cup match, black events, etc., became significant, became recognized. And so various things were done about that. So we've had cup match again changed 
cup match again have some recognition. Um, Emancipation Week takes place. We have some cup match events. So the friendly societies have something called the uh, Bermuda Cup Match Sportsmanship Award, where instead of looking at who made the most runs, who made the most spectacular catch. We focus on the commemoration of sportsmanship, of honesty, of integrity, of fair play, of teamwork, which again were things that the Friendly Societies relied upon and promoted because they wanted to develop ideas of individual and community, self-help and mutual help. So that um, Cup Match Sportsmanship Award is something that I would say is a change. Now we have so many Bermudians who live abroad. So we, not as before, we just had Bermudians who worked abroad for a period of time, but Bermudians who live abroad. At Cup Match, you will get people who are tuning in from Australia, the other part of the, you know, the opposite part of the world, all over the US, all over the UK, and by now, We've also built up a following of persons who recognize the uniqueness of the Cup Match celebration. So people who have become quasi-Bermudians, who show up in Bermuda for Cup Match. So we have this two-day celebration, people coming together. At Cup Match, everybody's your friend. Those who wear the same Cup Match colors are you, with you are your special friends. But even the guys who wear the other colors, they're still your friends. And as long as you smile, and as long as you are ready to allow yourself to be embraced, you will have a great time at Cup Match. Be careful how much you get embraced, because you will get drunk. National drink is black rum and ginger beer, and we love it. Be careful how you much you get into it, because as I say, we play crown and anchor. Again, an English descended game, gambling not allowed in Bermuda. But it's open gambling up at Cup Match. So again, you can either win a fortune or lose your ticket back home. That's part of the social atmosphere of Cup Match that I think that is really great. The other thing that we have to think about for the visitor is that Cup Match is actually built around a game of cricket that's supposed to be played on the field although you'll get as much cricket commentary in the boxes and off-field as you get on the field. And it's two teams of, of young players, males only at this point in time, although we're anticipating that we're about soon to get a female person being the first person to come into cup match. Um, but male only at this time, and it's supposed to be the best cricketers. And people really want to play for one team or the other because it's really about getting out there and showcasing your skills. Um, cricket is a rather strange game to people with the American psyche. American games do not have draws. We play till we have a winner. The curious English have this fantastic thing called no one won, no one lost, what we played for two days or five days. <laughs> Cup match is such a game. In the game of cricket, you have one person, the batsman, playing totally as an individual, being opposed by a team of 11 people. Again, a nice, I think, uh, analogy, a nice, a nice piece for how the friendly society saw themselves. The individual having to deal with the obstacles, etc., of the world about him, the society that was against him. This batsman has, at the opposite end, another batsman who can't directly help him. The batsman at bat has to face the bowler and all the fielders and the crowd and the conditions and the noise and the distraction. It's him against everybody else. And if he is able to protect his wicket, and hit the ball, he can run. He is assisted by the other batsman <laughs> who has to exchange places with him in order to score a run. If the other batsman does not 
exchange places, they don't get a run. So he has to be assisted by the other batsmen in order to score runs. Having said that it's an individual thing, an individual against a team, these individual batsmen, however, add all their scores together to make a team score. So again, it's the individual working with other individuals, self-help and mutual help, to overcome the other team. That's putting it in friendly society terms. That's not in the sporting terms, but I'm a friendly society advocate. <laughs> Those things that you actually speak to, which have become part and parcel of cup match, are some of the reasons why cup match became separated from the friendly society ethos. Because it's become a game and it's become a means of, of, of enjoyment and competition within itself. So that, and it's again ties in somewhat with cup match, with sorry, friendly society history, because it, one time, I'm embarrassed to say, we actually had a fight between friendly society members over the cricket game. And that's when it was appreciated that the game was getting too intense. Because um, friendly societies are speaking to certain objectives of developing the individual and developing the community. Cricket is spoken of as a gentleman's game requiring certain codes of behavior. If the umpire gives you out, and being given out is a judgment call, you have someone who's supposed to be a neutral person and who says to you, you are out. You don't question the umpire. You don't show dissent to stand there longer than is necessary is considered giving dissent. To be upset and throw your bat down or take off your gloves is unruly behavior. So there's all these norms and etiquettes of English upper class gentlefolk behavior into this game of cricket. And the friendly societies recognized and promoted this. So the friendly societies would have been a bit bothered at the idea that a batsman is out there fighting against another team, concentrating, taking his time, accumulating his runs, working at times with his partner, and he achieves a whole mark, 50 runs. And people run out there to give him money. That is demeaning his accomplishment to a simple monetary recognition. You give him money because he made 50. If he makes 49, you give him no recognition? He fought. He struggled. The man that makes 50 can only stay in if his partner stays in. The partner might have only made four. You give the batsman who made 50 a pot of money, clap him on the back, and the other guy who has been vital to him being able to be there gets nothing. So these are things that I understand, norms of the day, we all focus on the individual now, would not have been easily accepted by the friendly society ethos. We believe a rising tide lifts all boots. Everyone can contribute. Everyone will contribute. We don't all contribute at the same time. So, yes, I go cup match. Yes, I applaud when a guy makes 50, but I also understand the game. And so I don't say, gee, he made 50, and say of the other guy, well, you didn't do anything. Um, I also recognize that going out there and clapping a guy on the back, not everyone is being joyful. They're also trying to upset the guy. There's a bit of gamesmanship going on there. People go out and they walk on the wicket. Umpires shouldn't allow it. Last year, we gave the Sportsmanship Award to um, a Somerset player. And part of the reason we gave the award to this Somerset player 
was that this young player, first time in cup match, uh, had a bit of a, as far as the sporting side was concerned, had a bit of a, uh, of a moderate, was not a spectacular contribution. But what was also important was that last year was highly, and he played for Somerset, last year was highly significant for Somerset. Um, St. George's was a bit under pressure and were trying to save the match by what we call one of these infamous draws. If you score 600 runs and your opposing team scores 200 runs but are not all out, they draw. If they score one run and they're not all out, they draw. If they score 599 runs and are not all out, they draw. If they score 599 runs and are all out, they lose. And they are seen as more of an advantage than the team who scored 200 runs, lesser number of runs, but were not all out. So it's the little complexities of, of, of the game of cricket. So with gamesmanship, people will go out there to upset the other player. This particular young fellow, first time playing cup match, modest contribution in the field, etc., was fielding on the boundary. Ball was played down. The uh, batsman, I forget his name, was coming onto his half century or something like that. And people ran onto the field. So they interfered with the field of play. They interfered with the guy who was trying to field the ball. He didn't worry about it. And of course, when some of them ran down, one or two gave him a shove and made comments to him. Again, it's going beyond competition. Went onto the field. They congratulated their player. They went off the field. So this disrupted the game causes a bit of an upset with the umpire. They're actually in danger of destroying the pitch, which will be disadvantageous to their own players who are trying to save the match. They went back off the field. The music starts back up. Another event happened. I believe somebody was out or something or the other. Again, a set of players started to come onto the field. And this young guy playing in his first time of cup match got shoved around a little bit. And all he did was stop and say to the guys, no, no, don't come on the field. Don't come on the field. You're stopping the game. The umpires recognize that because he is actually assisting the umpires. He's working for the ethos of the whole game, for the whole enjoyment. He's assisting the umpires. He's also assisting the game. And he's been first time in cup match. None of my business. Why should I get involved? I'm not paid for this. He was already pushed previously because he's from the opposing team. And when they went on to celebrate the first, um, the guy's half century, um, you know. Um, but now they're upset, I think, because somebody was out, sort of running onto the field again, just disrupting. He said, no, guys, come on, come on, go off the field. You have to finish, you know, go off. And that was considered something that was worthy of note. So in between the two things, he was, uh, the umpires are the persons who recommend to us the recipient of the Sportsmanship Award. So for his contribution, as I say, fair play, teamwork, sportsmanship, we gave him the award last time. So that's where there have been changes in what I would say from the present focus on cup match as a moneymaker. Cup match is something where um, you talked of the old stance. Now, uh, we have a major promoter of cup match now, and uh, I'm not going to sort of denigrate them in any particular sort of way, but I think that if they want to be seen as a major promoter of cup match, they should be more of a major promoter of the community, not just the returns they get from cup match, and that's out there. Um, but they're a major promoter of cup match, so we no longer have the small stands that used to be built. We used to build what was called a, a pitch or a camp. And the night before cup match, and cup match are the, again, it's a little part of the, 
exotic um, celebration of Bermuda Cup match is always the Thursday and Friday before the first Monday that occurs in August. So you never know exactly when Cup match is going to occur. You need an advocate to work out when it's going to be. But anyhow, on the Wednesday night, it was traditional. You got started a little bit early in the day that you had a pre-Cup match sort of ritual. Fellas went up to meet with the mates who were building the camp. And you had, you know, the rival camps being built. So you would have, you would, the idea of building a camp was to say, this allocation of space, I think it was about, about 12 feet by 10 feet or something like this. This allocation of space will be enough for me to set up a bar, of course, to set up some food stations, to set up some chairs for the seniors, to set up a little play area for the children, and to be able to invite my friends. And everybody who came by should be served. Big focus on the family, but set up by a group of men usually. And the women came along and did their things. And so they were, they were sometimes pretty ramshackle because it depend on the, de depended on the carpentry skills of who I was the major person. So some of them had four right angles. Some of them had two right angles and a few other angles, as long as it all added up to 360, if you know your math, and didn't fall down. And this was part of the fun of it. And you decorated it and all the rest of that. But the club could only make a certain amount from it. People brought in their own liquor, brought in their own food, and the club provided the space and sort of the, the modicum of facilities. Now we have great big stands, three stories high. Um, I believe this year someone had all white couches. Fantastic! You know, you almost can land your helicopter and get out and come to the match. Okay, it's all right. We've always had the communal stands where everyone goes. Uh, you know, if you don't want to bother to put up a pitch, you go to the community stands, you walk around from the communal stands, and tell your children where they are in the communal stands so they know where to find their way, and parents go out and visit all your friends, visit all the opponents, have a socializing drink, have a piece of chicken here, some fish over there, go to all the ethnic food, all the people from St. David's and so, enjoy a good old time. It's now commercialized. The club brings in all the liquor. The club controls this. The club controls that. And yes, I understand it takes money to make cup match and to drive cup match. But is it still a community event celebrating emancipation? Or is it purely something to drive money? And I'm not even sure that the club and the community are getting the maximum benefit out of it when the major sponsor is, as, is, as I said, has become somebody who I think focuses on their returns and not necessarily focusing on what is the community good. So that's where Cup Match has changed a bit. But Cup Match, for all of that, is and still will be a fantastic celebration, unique. Um, you know, I know I've mentioned of Carnival. Carnival is wild. It's abandoned. It's gay. And it goes on for days. That's not quite what we evolved in Bermuda. We have cop match. It's wild. It's crazy. Everybody's fun. It's tight because we focus on cricket. It has something very specific. It is very uh, uh, organized. It is irreverent. We break the laws about gambling, about public drinking, about, you know, the normal staid Bermuda atmosphere. Everybody's with everybody. Everybody's shouting. Every it's Bermuda. It's cup match. It's, it's, it's like a carnival, a Mardi Gras, all of it all turned into one because it is still so community focused. It's still so much fun. And yet it's two days, yet it's under control. It's not craziness. It's wow, but not craziness. So that, that, that is the uniqueness that will probably always be coming.